I got a job in New York City a couple of years ago. Personally, I am happy to be away from that place now, but I was able to experience many things and learn quite a bit there. These stories that I am about to talk about are not my personal experiences except for the last story. The other two are based on my co-workers that I was privileged to work with. I was given these stories because, as a foreigner, I was curious about how they lived in the city and decided to ask them about what their scariest experiences were while growing up in such a crazy place. Number 1. First story was about my boss, actually. He told me that there was an event he would never forget when he was younger in high school. He was with a friend and they were kicking back after school ended while walking near one of the buildings that were around the Empire State Building. He said he was hanging out with one of his good friends and they both noticed that there was a human leg just chilling out on the sidewalk. Most of the busy people walking by that leg seemed to also just not bother to care as to why it was there or were just not interested in the situation. Apparently it was closer towards the wall of the building and they didn't really think much of it because they knew Halloween was coming up and thought maybe it was some prop for the store nearby. They found out later on that someone had ended their own life and the body was partly dangling some floors above them somewhere while one of the legs was just hanging out having a good time on the sidewalk. There were a few things that bothered me about this story, like the fact that there wouldn't have been a lot of blood. Wouldn't people be freaking out? Maybe a few strangers did see the mess but decided not to make a scene. I'm not sure. At least from knowing my boss for a good three years, he's never lied to me. Story 2 Another was from my co-worker that I worked with and was pretty close to. He also experienced something that I'm not even sure I would be mentally okay with seeing if I was his age. When he was in elementary school, apparently his school allowed them to take a dragon boat lesson. They would row out to one of the rivers, wasn't sure if it was the Hudson or East River, but apparently when they were out in the boats, his team saw something floating in the water. They all rowed closer towards it, and he apparently said he saw a mat of hair and pale white melted skin. All of them rowed back and told the grown-ups what they had discovered, and the cops went out and recovered it. I remember asking him if any of them decided to turn it over, but he said none of them were willing or even desired to turn the head around to see the face. I don't remember if he told me that they had found out it was a girl or a woman that the head belonged to. All I know is that I would have also not been okay after dealing with such an experience. Story 3 This last story is not as mentally scarring, but just crazy. This experience actually happened to me in my second year of working there. Don't live in this city if you're poor. Your conditions are that of caged rats. I live with five people in a crammed shoebox and I managed to fall ill with mono. Apparently all of my roommates had experienced mono already and there are no such things as dishwashers so I found out that anyone could have given me it, including my partner. I was sick in bed and finally coming to my second week of it. It felt a lot like flu and I just took it real easy. Around 2pm I realized I needed to get out and get food to sort of fight the sickness because there was barely any room in the fridge to have groceries to cook for yourself with, so I was getting my slow self ready to go out and suddenly I hear what sounds like a loud smash. I thought a car crashed into another car and really didn't think anything of it, until I heard someone screaming out, put the gun down, multiple times, while hearing someone else saying I didn't do it in an almost mumbling tone. I crawled to my window, still fuzzy and spaced out while watching all of these people on the other sidewalk just stopping and filming everything with their phones. No one is running. I'm hearing these two men just screaming at each other while everyone thinks it's an awesome time to Instagram a shooting. Something really twisted and dark clicked in me when I noticed this. I sit there for a good 15 minutes trying to figure out what I'm going to do. The cops arrive and I can barely see anything down below but I see a crowd forming around yellow tape. I decide to leave anyway because, again, I really needed food. My building is thankfully only five stories big so it was easy to walk down to the front door. The awkward thing however was realizing that your door is the actual crime scene and there's yellow tape all over your staircase while crowds of people are taking pictures of your sick self. Thankfully the victim that was shot I believe was okay. It was a petty robbery. They did get shot in the stomach, but weirdly enough, I didn't see any blood anywhere, which is bizarre. I politely asked the cop guarding the area if I was allowed to go through the crime scene to go get food. 
I remember he looked at me as if this happened every day. He looked exhausted, which maybe it did. They allowed me out of the area and also gave me permission back in. At least the cops were nice. And needless to say, New York is a pretty weird place. So for a bit of background, I'm a 30-year-old female that has worked for an ophthalmologist or eye doctor, since I always have to clarify for about nine years now. I work in a big city, but not in a very good area, right next to a meth clinic in fact, so that's probably why this story happened in the first place. I'm a technician, which means I take the patients back to the rooms to get them ready to see the doctor. This guy comes in, must weigh about 400 pounds, and just starts acting very loud and obnoxious in our waiting room. Instead of bringing a list of his medications like we asked for, he brought a plastic shopping bag full, and I mean full, of pills. The way our office is set up is that we don't have sliding check-in windows like some offices. We just have four desks in a row that you walk up to. The first desk is right next to a wall that has a small tinted window that we can quote-unquote see out of, but it really does crap. For that reason, we can't really see what's going on in the waiting room until we actually walk out there. So I have this guy's chart, and I'm getting ready to call him, and I notice that there's a huge line of patients waiting to check in. Now remember that I can't see what's going on until I actually get out there. What happened is that these people aren't checking in at all, but coming up to the desk to complain that this 400 pound man is stripping off his clothes in front of everyone. I take one look at this and go grab my boss who goes out and yells at him to stop. He tells her that he wants the doctor to see his scars. Like, are you kidding me? We're an eye doctor dude, so we don't need to see all of that. He does end up getting dressed and I'm thinking that we're going to throw him out because really that's not okay. I know he obviously has mental or drug related issues, but this isn't the place. Or, at the very least, he shouldn't go unsupervised. But no, we do end up seeing him and I'm still the one to take him back. I'm 5'3", on the shorter side, and I've dealt with crazy patients before, so I kind of put on my take-no-crap persona. I can't let him know that he gets to me. I'm instructed by my boss to take one of the other girls with me as a witness. Okay, whatever. I get him back in the room, and after sitting in the exam chair, he immediately gets in my face, saying I need to find someone to take out his eye. I'm like, whoa, okay, slow down there, buddy. I check his vision, which is a perfect 20-20 and he's not complaining of any pain or anything strange. He just wants his eye removed. So I'm trying to lighten the tension in this room by laughing slightly and saying something like, well, I'm not sure that would be a good idea. He says if I can't find someone to take out his eye, that he's going to go down to the hospital and rip it out himself. Okay, my work here is done. The doctor will be with you soon. I'm not sure what happened in that room, but... When he's on his way out, he got on our public phone and was speaking very loudly to someone, calling them terrible names and then hanging up angrily. Then he left. I've read his chart saying that he isn't allowed back for obvious reasons. This is a very old incident. I'm a married mother of four in my late 30s now and this happened when I was 11 or 12 years old. My mom had taken me to a dentist appointment and afterwards dropped me off at my grandma's house so that she could go back to work. My grandma had a house with two barns in the middle of nowhere, lots of places to wander and explore, plus she had a dish so I was happy to have a day off from school to do basically whatever I wanted. So I'm sitting in her big cozy armchair in her living room watching Animal Planet on her big screen TV when the back door, directly to my left and across the dining room, opened. In comes my great-grandma, Mildred. She's nice, but I rarely see her. Behind her, however, is my waking nightmare. I'll call him Uncle Alan. He's my grandma's brother, so great uncle. He's the one the family always kept their kids away from just because he's creepy. And he is. I'm terrified of him because I know he's more than creepy. He abused my mom for years as a child only stopping when she got to her teens and no longer appealed to him. My mom has mental issues to this day because of what he put her through. None of this was known to anyone besides my mom, dad, and me at this time. She was too terrified to tell anyone and didn't even tell her mother until she was in her 40s, a few years after this story takes place. 
So my grandma and Mildred are sitting on the couch and have no idea what he is, but I do. He leers at me, just 11 or 12 and looking 9 or 10 and I panicked. I wasn't alone, but in blind fear I ran. I bolted out of my seat and out the front door. I went around the side of grandma's house and started toward the nearest barn, suddenly realizing I'm now alone and going to the barn would be a very bad idea. So I circled the house to my grandma's bedroom window and climbed back inside. I had severe arachnophobia and there were two black widow spiders hanging underneath that window, but I climbed in anyway. That's how scared I was. Once inside, I didn't want to be around him, so I didn't go back to the living room. I looked around and decided to just hide until he and Mildred left. I dove under the bed. I had very short legs and a skirt around it, so it was all thanks to my small for my age size that I could fit under there at all. I was under for about 20 minutes or so, starting to feel silly and seriously considering coming out, when I heard footsteps coming down the hall. I figured it was my grandma and was about to crawl out, thinking I could stick to her and join the others again with her. But it wasn't her. I watched from my hiding spot as a pair of dirty boots came into the room. It was my Uncle Alan. My heart raced. He moved to the opposite side of the room and seemed to look behind the entertainment center to the right of the foot of the bed, then back around and checked the bathroom and towel cabinet attached to Grandma's room on the left of the bed, then my Grandma's closet. Her closet is a walk-in. He went inside and I could hear him moving her things around, searching. I was near tears as he searched because even as a kid, I knew he'd have no reason to be searching my grandma's bedroom. I knew he was looking for me. I could only assume that he didn't look under the bed because it didn't look high enough for anyone to fit. After the closet, he left. I don't know how long it was, but I stayed until I overheard their goodbyes and then I crawled out. I went to the living room, sat down beside my grandma's feet. I didn't dare move again. I found out later that my grandma and Mildred had gone down the road for a few minutes to drop something off at a friend's house. That must have been the time he was searching for me. It turned out that he only left to pick up a car part with my grandpa and came back a short while later. I'll never forget the look on his face, seeing me sitting at my grandma's feet. I guess it was a cross between rage and hate. It was gone instantly. He and Mildred left shortly after this and I went back to watching Animal Planet trying to calm my nerves. My mom arrived about an hour later, made small talk, and then we left. I never told her about what happened that day. She knew he'd been at the house from talking to my grandma, but didn't ask me about it. I don't know if she even knew my grandma had left the house while he was there. I'm just glad he never checked under that bed, and it makes me sick to my stomach to think what would have happened if he did. My brother made a post on R Let's Not Meet four years ago. You can see my comment in the comments section of the original post and his confirmation that I am indeed his sister. I only made some changes to the grammar, and I originally thought of writing it but told my brother he should because he would have a better memory of this event and was more aware of the situation. He was about 13 and I was just about to turn 9. If you want to hear it from my perspective, I can write in the comments. From my brother's perspective... I was about 13 years old when this incident occurred, so it was 8 years ago, I think. Me and my family were on vacation in Orlando, and we were staying at the Nickelodeon Hotel. Very cool place, nice water parks and nice rooms. I was with my family, my mom, dad, brother, and two sisters. I am the oldest. We were at Universal Studios for the day, and I got back rather late. On the way to our room, my parents were carrying all of the merchandise we bought, which was a lot because they had four kids so they kind of fell behind. Me and my two sisters, around the ages of eight and six, all got ahead of them together. My parents and brother, about age ten, were behind us. The elevator was just around the corner. Me and my sister got to it first. The elevator opened just as we were walking around the corner. As we were walking around the corner, a man stepped off the elevator. I barely got a look at him because as soon as he saw me and my sisters, he immediately got back on without missing a beat. I should have known that was a bad sign, but unfortunately I was a little slow back then, so it never occurred to me that this guy was trouble. Plus my parents were not there to see the man, so they never stopped us from getting on the elevator. My sisters were rushing to get on the elevator because they were at the I want to press the button age. 
We all get on to see the man standing with his head facing the ground, both hands behind his back, and standing in the back of the elevator. He was very creepy looking. He had brown hair that reached the middle of his neck and looked like he hadn't showered in weeks. He looked like he was in his late 40s, or early 50s because he had many wrinkles on his face and a creepy grin. He was wearing black jeans, a red, black, and white flannel, and a black turtleneck underneath. Keep in mind, we were in Florida, and this was a hot night, so it was weird that he was wearing all of these layers. My youngest sister goes to press the fourth floor button, but all of the buttons were lit up already. I wish I could say that was what made me realize we were in trouble, but it didn't click just yet that this guy pressed all of the buttons. I held the door open for my parents and brother, and then my mom looked at the guy. I will never forget the face she made. She had a huge smile on her face looking at my brother, but when she looked at the man, that smile instantly dropped. I saw the look of terror in my mom's face. My dad even gave a strange look at the guy like he knew to watch out for him. That was the moment when I realized that this man was up to no good. Once the elevator doors closed, my parents stood on each side of the man staring at him, just waiting to jump into action in case he made a move. My brother asked my sisters out loud, why did you guys press all the buttons? And the older one of my two sisters, still completely oblivious to what was happening, blurted out, That guy did it, and pointed right at the man. My mom let out a nervous giggle. The elevator was slow, but finally got to the second floor. The man quickly got out of the elevator and went down the hallway. As soon as he left, my mom quickly closed the doors and we continued up. We stopped at the third floor, closed the doors, then got to our floor, the fourth floor. My parents made sure we stayed with them this time. We got to our room and that is when my parents started to freak out. My dad called the front desk to warn them about what happened so they could check it out. That was the last we ever saw of that man. We don't even know if the people at the hotel found him. All I can say now is I'm glad my family and I are still alive. God only knows what he would have done to one of us or all of us if my parents weren't there. So I had just posted a true story that was from the perspective of my brother. I decided to write this from my perspective and even called my parents to ask them what they remembered from the event. Now this crazy experience happened to my family when I was about 13 years ago in an elevator at the Nickelodeon Hotel that still creeps me out to this day. I was just a young girl about to turn 9 years old. My siblings, which included two older brothers and a younger sister, were 13, 10, and 7 years old at the time. We'll call my 13-year-old brother Joey, my 10-year-old brother Michael, and my 7-year-old sister Marie. At the time, the kids' TV network, Nickelodeon, was constantly advertising the Nickelodeon Hotel in Orlando, Florida. The commercials showed so many cool things, such as a water park, the chance of getting the famous slime dumped on you, getting to meet the characters of your favorite shows, basically people dressed up as those characters and other fun stuff. I begged my parents to take us. During that time, it was every little kid's dream to have that green slime poured all over them and even though Nickelodeon had some competition with Disney Channel and Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon was still most kids' favorite channel. Eventually, my parents decided to get an awesome suite one summer in July. The hotel was pretty fun. I didn't get to live out my fantasy of getting the green slime dumped on me, but my family and I enjoy this place overall. One of those days in Orlando, we decided to go to Universal Studios Florida and the Universal Islands of Adventure. I don't remember much of the day besides going to the Mummy Ride, the Incredible Hulk Coaster, and the Back to the Future Ride a bunch of times. We ended up coming back late. When we got back to the hotel, Marie and I were racing towards the elevator to get the privilege to press the button with Joey not far behind us. My parents fell behind because they were carrying all the merchandise we bought at Universal Studio. Michael was walking next to my parents. I barely was aware of anything else at that time. My only goal was to press the button because I was a kid amused by doing stuff like that. Once Marie and I made it, we noticed that all the buttons were already pressed and there was a man in the elevator. We didn't notice this at the time, but according to Joey, he was getting off of the elevator, but when he spotted Marie and I traveling around the corner to the elevator, he got back on. I should have been more aware of my surroundings. My public school and parents had pushed the stranger danger mindset on me. In my childlike mind, I didn't see any danger. The stranger was not trying to talk to me, get me in his car, entice me with candy, 
touch me in a spot that he was not supposed to touch or hurt me in any way. Plus, I knew my parents were somewhere behind me. This man was very strange looking. He was probably in his 40s or 50s. He had greasy brown hair that reached the middle of his neck. I also remember him being fairly tall, but that could have been due to my childlike view of the world. His outfit consisted of black jeans and a black turtleneck with a flannel shirt covering it. Looking back, this was strange because it was extremely hot tonight in Florida, probably around 90 degrees Fahrenheit. He also had a creepy smile. According to Joey, my mom was smiling looking at Michael, but once her eyes looked at the strange man, her smile completely dropped. While my dad didn't have as dramatic of a change of his face, he also noticed him and found him suspicious. My parents rushed to the elevator and stood on both sides of him. They didn't even need to discuss any plan because they both knew what to do. My mom and dad were ready to attack him at any moment if he tried to touch a single strand of hair on their kids. While my mom might not be as tall as the average woman, my dad is a 6 foot 2 tall stocky man and can look pretty intimidating when you don't know him. Trust me when I say that my parents knew how to kick someone's butt when they messed with their family or friend. I usually never promote violence, but creeps like this man probably deserve it. During this entire time, he kept looking down and had his hands behind his back. Keep in mind, I was only aware of many of the details years afterwards, probably in my teen years. Michael asked Marie and I why we pressed every button. We both informed him that neither of us did this. And very loudly, I innocently and naively announced, That guy did it. While pointing at the creepy man, my mom just nervously laughed. According to my oldest brother Joey, the strange man got off on the second floor. According to my mom, he stayed and only our family got off on the fourth floor, which was the floor our room was on. I honestly couldn't remember. I have learned in a psychology course that kids often create false memories, so I think that my mom was probably correct, but it really doesn't matter. When we got off the elevator to our floor, my mom made sure we stayed together. My mom would usually only demand that we were very close to one another when we were at a crowded place. I remember finding this kind of strange, but I just brushed this feeling off my shoulders and followed her orders. Once we got into our room, my dad called hotel security. This is when I finally was aware of the danger of the situation. Back then, I thought that this man would maybe just kidnap my sister and I because he is a bad person. Now I believe that this man was something worse. I wanted to do terrible things to my sister and I. My guess is that he pressed all the buttons to prevent others from using it and possibly get away with something on the elevator. Maybe he would have taken us to his room with the promise of something else. Maybe he would have picked us up and abducted us. He could have possibly had a knife, but once he saw my parents, he knew he could not take on both adults. Even though I have an idea of what he would have done, I wonder what would have happened if my parents did not make it to the elevator or my brother was not far behind us. Another thing I wondered is if he might have only been after my little sister. He could have also been after my oldest brother as well, but I doubt this. Joey said he was looking at us girls when he walked back in the elevator. If I had to guess why he was wearing all those layers, I would say that he was probably trying to cover up specific tattoos or birthmarks. I did some research online and one thing I found is that in the state of Florida when a person registers as an offender, he or she is required to give many details about themselves, including tattoos and other identifying marks. To this day, I don't know if they ever found the creep. I just hope other kids were as lucky as us. For some background... I'm a 14-year-old male living in a city on the east coast known for crabs. I attend a fairly nice private school and generally have loved it, except for one teacher. I'll call her by her first name, Laurel, because she was truly an awful soul. I first met Laurel and everyone else's second day of fifth grade as I was sick on the first day. As we all poured into our homerooms, the teacher, who we'll call Mrs. B, talked about our morning announcements while Laurel stood in the back. She was the theater teacher, which means she didn't have a classroom. This is also the reason why some people excuse her actions towards me, because she was just acting. Like any fresh out of lower school student, I accidentally called out. No big deal as I am sure everybody had already in their first day. When the bell rings, everybody stands up to go to chapel and she calls me over to her. 
I am most likely expecting some sort of, hey, don't call out, thing from a teacher, and I was correct, but off by years. It starts out normal enough and then goes south really quickly. She begins berating me on how I am acting like a two-year-old and how her child is acting better than me and how I shouldn't have the privilege of being at such an elite school. All the while, her two-year-old is right with her knocking over everything at waist height in the classroom. After her speech is finished, I am visibly shaken and have tears in my eyes. Laurel then looks at me, laughs, and goes to her class. Obviously, I tell my parents that night, and my mom seems ticked, but didn't say anything to any staff as it was too early in the year for anybody to care. Fast forward a few weeks of beration and complaining to my parents, and the big kicker comes. While sitting at carpool waiting for my mother, I get pushed into a wall by one of my peers after repeatedly saying their name. I was taken aback as I was doing this the day before and he was playing along. Laura had seen this and talked to the other classmate for about two minutes and then comes up to me. She, in an incredibly serious tone, tells me that all of this was my fault as he was in a bad mood because he had been caught playing Roblox. Yes, it was at this time, in the library when he wasn't supposed to. When I tell her that I didn't know, I could see her eyes go blood red. She tells me that back talk is unacceptable and that I am messing with a giant here. She then threatens to tie my shoes together and make me walk to my backpack which was in another area at the time. As a smart little kid, I decided the best response was, but if I fell, you'd break my nose. She then laughed and in the most serious tone told me, that's the plan. Now if you don't go over there and tell Johnny that you're sorry, I'll go through with my promise. At this moment, I'm visibly crying and people around me are starting to take interest. She says another barrage of hurtful comments and in my sobbing, I can see my mom's car pull up. Thinking this is my chance, I start to get up and tell her I have to leave. When I do this, she physically sits me back down and tells me to wait till she goes and talks to my mother. According to her, Laura walked up to the window and introduced herself and said that I was the instigator in an incident that left another student hurt, which, now looking back on it, is not what happened at all. Laura looks behind herself and motions for me to come to the car. I walk right past her and get in the front of my mom's car. As we pull away, the waterworks come out. I'm screaming and crying and try my best to tell her what just happened. My mom was floored. She called my father, who was at work, and told me to explain the whole thing. I once again told my dad the story and he over the phone seems angry. He said he'd figured it out and told my mom to stay out of it. She did, and as far as I know, nothing came of it. Skipping to the middle of fifth grade, she's in a hallway huddle with the whole grade. A hallway huddle where the whole grade plops into the biggest classroom to go over grade events and whatnot. After learning that someone in a different grade got hurt in a game of football on the field by a kid in a whole different grade, she goes off. While berating our grade, she then calls our whole grade douchebags. Yep. She then dismisses kids who were in her opinion being good and surprise surprise, guess who wasn't in that group? Yours truly. The kids who stayed inside were yelled at and got emails home. Of course, the first thing I tell my mom when I get home was what Laurel said to us. Again, my mom was floored and grabbed her computer to write a very angry email to the school. This time, they decided to be somewhat helpful and put her on a break for the rest of the week. That was all from that grade. There's more to come. In sixth grade, I was lucky to have her theater class for half the year. Hooray. She immediately makes it her goal to embarrass me and pickle me in class to her miserable heart's content, making me do surprise memorizations which consisted of being given 30 seconds to memorize a paragraph and recite it in front of the class while doing some ridiculous task. Naturally, my parents were not impressed by this and they, with some of the other parents, went in to have a meeting with the principal and the school psychologist about her behavior and might have mentioned at this point my mental state had started decreasing due to everything she had done to me, going so far as to becoming physically ill when entering her studio. The school said they would handle it, and she was later suspended with pay again. At this point, she must have found out that I was tipping the principal off, and she gave me extra lines and homework that was never able to be completed due to the quantity of it. She would also make me stay after school during my study hall time to memorize lines for only to be met with F's in every class I ever had of hers. By the 7th grade, 
This toll this woman had on me was noticeable. Between becoming ill at the sound of her name, to avoiding her completely by ducking into classrooms just not to be seen by her, she continued her verbal abuse, calling me nothing and unimportant, and flat tiring me in the hallways only to blame it on me for slowing down. By the end of the year, I was actually considering leaving my second home only for the reason to get away from her. Luckily, by that time, word was getting out that she was leaving. When this was confirmed with the 6th grade math teacher, I actually broke down and cried, knowing that it would all be over soon. When the magical day of June 6 rolled around, I was ecstatic. Not only because that was the end of school, but because it was the end of Laurel. Since then, I haven't run into her once, but I can only imagine the hell another unlucky student is having to go through right now. And one last thing, I know this story probably isn't as scary as some of the other stories on here, but this is more of a personal experience. And it also shows exactly how extreme teachers can be without knowing the consequences. This ended back in 2012, but the years before that, a ministry that my sister and I went to with my mom was literally borderlining being a cult. The leader was literally a nightmare. She called Pokemon the Chinese devil, yes and clearly stated that while the kids have school, she doesn't really care. After saying that, she also laughed like a maniac. She also gave all the members a book which I won't mention its name because it's out there. They also welcomed in a guy that mistreated younger women and treated him like a god. I know, very wrong. While a girl who came out was completely shut out. She was friends with my older sister, so only she knows of her friend's whereabouts. I don't know what compelled my mom to stay all those years, but finally in 2012, she simply sent a text to the leader telling her we would no longer be attending. I'm not sure how the leader responded, but to put it simply, that was the end of it. I know that leaving a cult nowadays is very difficult to do. As for my family, we found a new church and are doing a lot better now. I can play Pokemon and watch anime and my parents won't say anything. And my younger sister is doing well mainly because I think she was too young to remember. All I can wonder now is, what would have happened if we stayed? In 2015, the leader of this ministry began to face some major health problems and the ministry is no longer around. I'm not entirely sure that she's still alive today. I didn't write this to badmouth churches or other beliefs. I simply wanted to make it clear that absolutely anyone can say they're one person, but are completely the opposite. Back in 2015, my family and I moved to a small Alabama town. We previously lived in rural Alabama town before moving to this new town. My mom and stepdad couldn't find any available houses, so we moved to the projects. We're white, by the way. Living in the projects really wasn't so bad. But a lot of shady things happened there after dark. Drug dealing and domestic violence happened just about every week. One of the worst things that have ever happened when we were living there was when an elderly woman got stabbed to death. The elderly woman had just won the lottery, and when one of her neighbors found out, knocked on her door, stabbed her to death, and then turned the heat on full blast. I remember the police went around and asked everyone what they knew. Nobody knew anything, though. A few days later, they caught the person that did that to the elderly woman. I remember driving past the crime scene and seeing that elderly woman's bloody mattress on the side of the road. One night, I was sitting on the front porch and eating some raisinets. Then out of nowhere, I heard a man say, Hey man, can I chill with you till my homies pick me up? It was a middle-aged black man. He was about 5'8 in height and chubby. He introduced himself as homie. Not wanting to be mean, I said, Sure, I don't mind. He asked me how I was doing in school and what my grades were like. Throughout our conversation, I saw that he kept reaching for something in his shorts pocket. My gut told me that I was fixing to die, so I ended the conversation and told him, Well, I'm going to go inside and take a shower. He replied with, Alright, hit me up sometime. I got some Zan bars. This man made my danger radar go off like a car alarm. There's one major street gang in this town, and I'm pretty sure that Homie was one of them. A year later, my family moved to a safer town in Georgia.
Years ago when I was in college, I was driving past a friend's house. The porch light was on, so I thought I'd stop in and say hello. I was always known for being a bit of a prankster, and I happened to get the idea to freak my friend out. He never locked his door while he was home, so I slipped in and then slammed the door shut loudly. Then I heard him in the back room say, Hello? And I backed up against the wall, ready to jump out at him when he came to investigate. Then he asked, Who's there? With a bit of a quiver in his voice, I kept still and tried to control my laughter. Next, the lights went out and I didn't hear a sound, so I figured he realized what was going on and decided to reverse the prank. I didn't budge though, I was going to win this round. So I sat there and sat there, not a sound. Sitting in pitch black in a friend's apartment was starting to get to me, but I thought, I'm not letting him win no matter what. After what seemed like a solid five minutes, I gave up. I ran to the front door and flipped on the lights and yelled, Brendan? No response. I walked into the hall and turned on the hall light and then the bedroom light looking for him. No one was there. The bedroom had no windows either. I then called him on his cell phone thinking it would reveal his location. When he answered, he was out of town at a loud party with a bunch of friends. I flipped off the lights and got out of there. Neither of us had an explanation. This happened when I was 19 years old. I had this friend Maju, and we had lunch by ourselves together. One day this guy approached us at lunch. He told us that he was studying in the last high school grade and asked if he could join us. We agreed and we started talking. At first it was normal and we would meet at lunch and would talk, but one day he somehow discovered my Instagram account and started sending me messages. His messages were normal at first. He would just say hi and good night. But one day he sent a text asking me if I was going to our school swimming pool day. I asked why, but he didn't answer. So I said that I was going then and he answered. Oh, then I'm going too. I want to see how your hot body looks in a bikini. I was creeped out so I blocked him and texted Maju about what happened. And she told me that he asked for nudes from her. She refused and he kept insisting. So she sent the pics. I was scared about what he could do with her pictures, so I unblocked him and said sorry. The next day, he kept sending me texts just talking about my body and how he loved how curvy I was and stuff like that. He did that every day, until one day he sent me texts saying that in the last weeks of school, he would do something bad involving death and terrible stuff. I was creeped out, but I couldn't block him because he still had my friend's nudes. Some weeks come by and he continued with that psychological abuse. In the last week of school, my mother was going to pick me up at 5pm. It was 3.30pm when I was wandering into the school garden. He was hiding on a bush. When I passed by the bush, he jumped out, grabbed the phone on my hands and ran away. I searched the whole school but couldn't find him. At my school we have the basement area that is locked out for students but there is a window open that some students go in there to do stuff. So I go to the basement window to go in the basement and see my phone on the ground at the corner of the basement. When I pick up my phone, he jumps out of a box and starts bashing a piece of wood on my head until I pass out. When I woke up, I was naked and covered with my friend's jacket and my friend crying over me and the dean and police on the basement door. I tried to get up, but I couldn't. The pain was too much. After that, I got in an ambulance with my friend and she told me, I got a text from my phone from him. He said that he would hurt you and sent a picture of you naked with blood on the ground passed out. Then I recognized the school basement so I called the police and told them what happened and drove to the school. When I got here the officer was waiting for me. We ran to the basement and he was doing terrible things to you. The officer ran at him and handcuffed him and he had a bag with duct tape and a knife. Then I saw you. I checked for vital signs and and I covered you with my jacket. After this, I don't know what happened with the boy, but I changed schools and never saw him again. So, there are some strange occurrences that I can't help but feel are connected, and I'm actually genuinely afraid now. 
It started around February when I was sitting by a window one night playing with my dog while my boyfriend was at school. I got a phone call from an unknown number and I picked up to hear your stereotypical scary phone call, heavy breathing, and I hung up. A few minutes later I get another call from a different number with the same area code as mine so I pick up again and I hear, I see you, I know where you're at, and I panic, hanging up and blocking the number. I locked all the doors and ran upstairs and called my boyfriend. He convinced me that it was probably some middle schoolers doing some prank phone calls and did not worry. This continues sporadically over the course of a couple of weeks, but I don't think much of it since my boyfriend was probably right. Fast forward to April. I live in a gated community and there's not a lot of grass to walk my dog on, so I have to go across the street to a small area for him to do his business when I don't take him for a real walk in a wooded area outside my community. My dog is a black pit bull Dutch shepherd mix and when stretched out on my bed he's longer than my 5 foot self so he can be a little intimidating to people who don't know him. I have also had him professionally trained and so he normally is extremely obedient. While walking him he kept pulling towards my car, parked in the parking area in front of the grass and barking. We adopted him from a shelter and I think all of the barking there is why he almost never barks now so this was very strange behavior for him. I decided to take him inside and try again later if he wasn't going to listen, so I'm walking back up the driveway when he yanks me to the other way and his hackles are raised, growling and barking. I turn and pull him with me, and I see a man crouch behind my car with his phone held in front of his face taking pictures of me with his flash on. The car next to mine belonged to my landlord, so it's not like he was getting out of his car or anything. I screamed and ran inside dragging my 90 pound dog with me and locked all doors and windows and once again called my boyfriend crying not knowing what to do. He brought it to my attention that while very creepy it's not illegal in my state to take pictures and videos of someone without their permission and because of this I didn't call the police. Fast forward again to two weeks ago. For some background information there are parking lots between every six or seven houses in my community. I had come home from work late and the lot in front of the strip houses mine is located in had filled up so I parked in one of the ones further down the block. At 10am the next morning I'm walking to my car when I hear gravel crunching behind me. I turn around and there is an early 2000s Mercedes E320 crawling behind me very slowly with the brights on. I also notice that there is no front license plate but then I realized that I'm walking directly next to a strip of houses and I think I'm blocking this person from getting into their driveway so I walk a little faster. The car keeps pace with me and follows maybe three feet behind me until I get to the other parking lot and it stalls as I get into my car and drive away. I mention it to my boyfriend when we get home and I ask if I'm being paranoid about it and he agrees that it was very strange and told me to park in the driveway if there was no parking in front of our house and he would move it for me. I feel it important to note that we had never seen this car in the development before, and we would have noticed because my boyfriend used to have a 1996 model of the same car, so we would have pointed it out to each other. No one knew it was moved into the development either in several months, so either this car belonged to a guest of someone who lives here, or it stays in someone's garage for the most part. This past Thursday... I was again taking my dog to the grassy area in front of her house when he keeps pulling in one direction and sniffing. I figured he had just to do his business and smelled something interesting so I allowed him to do so. He leads me to the end of the parking lot in front of the grass and it's the car. I started to panic and I walk him around to the back of the car and took a quick side picture of the back license plate as I rushed us inside. This car had a Florida license plate with six digits, the last three being letters. I don't know what's standard for Florida, but in my state, DMV issued plates have seven digits and the last four are numbers, which leads me to believe that it's a custom plate. The car didn't move, and myself nor my boyfriend noticed anyone go in or out of it. When I came back from running errands this morning, the car was gone. I don't know what to do. Any advice or input would be welcome.
I've always been very skeptical of ghost sightings because I've never seen anything and haven't to this day. So what my cousins did was terrible. It still makes me mad thinking about it. So the younger brother was playing around with their webcam and their old lousy computer. He took a picture of his sister at the dinner table and in the picture, you can clearly see different people that are not supposed to be there. My cousin, who is the oldest of all of them, claims to be sensitive to this stuff. She was always tormented by ghost kids in their trailer house that they used to live in. She would always see a duende, which in Mexico were the spirits of children that embody this dwarf gnome looking thing. They look like a little person or a little kid, but have the face of an old person with beady eyes, so I've heard. Their eyes look like how a cat's eyes would, round and close together. They supposedly sound like little kids too and are quite mischievous, so apparently they will reside where a child has died. This thing would always visit her at night and wake her up and would be standing at the end of her bed playing with her toes. She said he would tickle them and laughed. The first time it happened, she thought it was her brother messing with her, so she peered to look who it was and was horrified by the thing. So yeah, she'd seen that thing, and she'd see a boy crying in her room and other things I don't remember. Now the picture they showed me was a picture of my cousins at the dinner table and the oldest walking towards the camera. Beside her standing was this white girl with blonde locks and a dress. Wore Mexican black hair, tanned skin. The ghost kids in the picture were obviously Caucasian children and were a little transparent and blurred. There was also a baby in diapers crawling under the dinner table and I can't remember if the third kid was sitting on the table or standing beside it. And I was so amazed because I know for a fact that they couldn't have photoshopped it. They were not tech savvy at all. They used to think that their Wi-Fi worked like data and if you used it a lot it would run out, so I'm saying I saw it with my two eyes. It sucks that ghosts always decide to be shown when people are taking pictures with crappy low-res cameras. My brother tried emailing the picture to his phone so we could post it somewhere, but it was always corrupted. My cousin later gave her laptop away to another cousin because it stopped working correctly and apparently all the memory got wiped. It's honestly terrible. The one time we had real proof that made the child within me believe in something crazy got deleted. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, our Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear it featured here on the channel. And join my Discord to interact with me directly and all the other great people that are part of this community. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.